For the purposes of this video, let us assume that an A above middle C is a note that vibrates at 440 hertz, that is to say 440 times per second. It's not always 440 for reasons that I'll probably explain in another video, but 440 works well for the maths that we'll be doing here. I'm going to take us on a journey from Pythagoras in the 6th century BCE to the Renaissance composers of the 16th century, covering maths and harmony and physical attributes of musical instruments, and try to answer the question, are C-sharp and D-flat the same pitch? Musical pitch is determined by the frequency of vibration. This tuning fork is made such that when struck, it vibrates at exactly 440 times per second. When I put it on the table, it causes resonant vibrations in the table that amplify the note that we hear. When a violin plays an A string, the string is just the right thickness that when tightened to the right tension, it will vibrate exactly 440 times in a second. This tenor recorder is just the right length and thickness that if I cover up the first three holes, the air inside will bounce around at 440 times per second. Same vibrations, same note. For a singer to sing an A in tune, they are actually finely controlling the vocal cords to vibrate at exactly 440 times per second. When you hear an A, it is because the vibrations of the instruments are causing vibrations in the air, which cause little hairs inside your ears to vibrate 440 times per second, which your brain interprets as an A. Harmony is very closely related to vibration frequencies, and there's a lot of maths involved. Let's start with an A on a cello. It is an octave below the A on a violin, and it's no coincidence that the strings on a cello are about twice as long as those on a violin. A longer string vibrates slower, and if it vibrates at exactly half the speed, it produces an A an octave below. The cello's A string vibrates at 220 hertz, exactly half that of the violin's A string. That 2 to 1 ratio is important. If we put it on a graph, it looks like this. Our brains love the way this matches up. 2 to 1 is such a beautiful ratio and it works so well that our brains actually hear it as the same note, which is why we call both notes A. When I play the A string on my bass guitar, the thicker string vibrates even slower. In fact, this one is 55 hertz. It's still an A, but now it's three octaves below the original pitch. If I had a slow motion camera, I could probably literally count the oscillations of the string. Now here's the clever bit. If I take the string and divide it in half, the remaining portion of the string vibrates twice as fast. This brings us an octave. If I take a descant recorder and play an A, it comes out one octave above the tenor recorder. And no surprise, the descant is about half the size of the tenor. So you can see that music and harmony are very closely linked to physical attributes of the instruments. Way back in Pythagoras' time, the ancient Greeks didn't really conceive numbers in the same way that we do now, as points on a line going positive and negative. Numbers were more like individual concepts with special meanings and even genders. Odd numbers were male and even numbers were female. They didn't have the concept of the number zero yet, but what they had was relationships between numbers and the followers of Pythagoras, the Pythagoreans, absolutely loved ratios. Side note, one day somebody had the nerve to try Pythagoras' famous triangle equation on sides with length one. It followed that the hypotenuse must be the square root of two. And try as they might, they couldn't find two whole numbers with a ratio equal to the square root of two. Eventually, somebody managed to prove that there was no such ratio. It is what we now call irrational. But instead of accepting this new fact, they hushed it up and they killed the person who found it. That's how much they loved ratios. Pythagoras believed in the perfection of ratios and loved the way that they sounded musically. I can show some more examples. After two to one, the next most pleasing ratio is three to one. It sounds like this. That's quite a large interval, but we know that we can halve a note's frequency to bring it down an octave. So when we do that, we come to a three to two ratio. Look how nicely the frequency waves interact and how pleasing the ratio sounds to our ears. This ratio is what we call a perfect fifth because it's five steps up the major scale. A perfect fourth is also a very pleasing sound with a four to three ratio. Don't worry that the frequency has a recurring digit. That didn't matter at all to Pythagoras. So long as it can be written as a ratio, it's a good number. 
Pythagoras carried on making more notes using the ratios for fifths, fourths and octaves. As the ratios became more complex, the musical intervals sounded less pleasant. For example, the ratio for the Pythagorean major seventh was 243 to 128. That isn't as strange as it sounds once you realise that 243 is 3 to the power 5 and 128 is 2 to the power 7. It's the same thing as going an octave and a half up five times and then coming down seven octaves. Here's a few more lovely Pythagorean ratios for you. A major third is 81 to 64. A minor third is 32 to 27. A minor six is 128 to 81. Now watch what happens if we take that C from the minor third and that F from the minor six. What? That's supposed to be a perfect fourth with a nice four to three ratio. Not only is it not four to three, it can't even be expressed as a ratio of two integers. We have an irrational number here. This is the problem with Pythagoras' method. It only works in one key at a time. Still, this tuning system was the best there was for about 2000 years, and composers just learned to avoid certain intervals. The solution to these tuning problems didn't really come about until the Renaissance era in about the 16th century. Finally, we had learned to accept that irrational numbers exist, and we use them to our advantage. Remember our good old friend the square root of 2? If we use the 12th root of 2 as an increment in pitch, we can build a 12-tone scale where each semitone is exactly the same distance apart. Here is a Pythagorean chromatic scale starting on A equals 220. And here is the equivalent scale in the 12-tone equal temperament. They're very similar, but if we put them side by side, we can see that there are some slight differences. The 12 tone equal temperament scale is actually slightly out of tune for all intervals apart from the octave, according to Pure Harmony. But fortunately, it's so close that our ears just accept it. Or at least they do now because, spoiler alert, this is the scale that we still use today, so we've become used to it. For those living in the 16th century who were used to Pythagorean tuning, this new tuning system sounded slightly out of tune. For those of you with a musical ear, you may well feel like the Pythagorean major scale sounds a bit out of tune to you. The way you're feeling now is probably similar to the way the people felt in the Renaissance when they first heard an equal temperament scale. But at the time that this was happening, a new instrument called the piano was becoming very popular, and 12-tone equal temperament was an obvious choice for it. And then Bach wrote the well-tempered clavier, a series of pieces in each of the 12 keys, both major and minor, basically just to show off that the piano could play them all without any retuning. And the rest is history. Almost every piece of Western music these days is based on 12-tone equal temperament. Incidentally, I previously made a video about 7-tone and 5-tone equal temperament. I'll link that in the description if you're interested. If you've made it this far in the video, you're probably ready to accept that the question of whether C-sharp and D-flat are the same pitch is not an easy one to answer. Yes, of course, on a piano they are the same note, but as we now know, the piano is a compromise. It embraces 12-tone equal temperament, the jack of all keys and master of none. It allows every note to be slightly out of tune in order to sound reasonably good in all keys. Let's go back to Pythagoras for a moment and hear a major third in the key of A. I'll use pure sine waves now so that you can hear them clearly. Sounds pretty nice, right? Pythagoras certainly thought so. Now I'm going to switch key to A flat and play a perfect fourth in Pythagorean tuning. A lovely four to three ratio, so pleasing to our ears. But maybe you've noticed that C sharp and that D flat are not the same frequency and therefore not quite the same pitch. This is the point I've been making about Pythagorean tuning. The notes are not the same in every key. Now let's bring in the 12 tone equal temperament for that note. See, equal temperament has placed it right in the middle. The question is now, which do you prefer? Pythagorean tuning or 12 tone equal temperament? Here's the Pythagorean major third again versus 12 tone equal temperament. And here's the Pythagorean perfect fourth and the 12 tone equal temperament.
I'm curious to know, can you hear the difference? And if so, which do you prefer? The mathematically perfect Pythagorean tuning or the 12 tone equal temperament that we've become so accustomed to? Let me know in the comments below. Personally, I can hear a difference, but I'm not bothered enough to have a preference. Both Pythagorean tuning and 12 tone sound fine to me in these examples. Anyway, that's all I got for today. Let me know if you'd like a video on the alternatives to A equals 440. And as always, thanks for watching.